Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we'll give people a chance to enter the room and we'll get started in just a few minutes. Thanks for being here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we'll get started in just a few minutes. We'll allow uh, others a chance to join. Um, thanks for coming today. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Welcome to our uh, presentation on what student loan borrowers need to know right now. Uh, my name is Amy Salata. I'm the Outreach and Advocacy Manager at the Student Borrower Protection Center. And for those of you who don't know, we're a national nonprofit policy organization focused solely on alleviating the burden of student debt for borrowers across the country. And we do this through a mixture of advocacy, policymaking, and litigation strategy to rein in industry abuses, protect borrowers' rights, and advance economic opportunity for the next generation of students. I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, we're going to be covering a lot of material. And I'm joined by my colleague, Kat Wilbeck, um, our Director of Advocacy and Civil Rights Council, who will be helping us um, to collect questions from you all. And so if you do have questions throughout the presentation, please put them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window and we'll get to as many as we can at, at the end of the presentation. Um, and after this um, presentation, we'll be sharing the recording along with some resources um, so that you can follow up afterwards to, to make sure that you got all the information. Okay, with that, I think we'll just, we'll get started. Um, so, Here's a list of some uh, topics that we'll be covering this afternoon. Um, again, it's a lot of information, but um, you know we'll get through it together and plenty of time for questions if you all have them at the end. All right, so with that, let's start with the recent Supreme Court decision that happened in late June um, and any re debt relief updates from, from President Biden and the, the Department of Education. Um, so, as I'm sure you all know by now, at the end of June, um, you know, the Supreme Court decision came down. This was um, regarding the plan that President Biden announced last August that would have provided up to $20,000 in debt relief for people who used Pell Grants at any point in their educational career, um, and then also $10,000 in relief for any other federal borrower. The application was open really briefly in the fall of 2022, um, and 26 million people applied during that time, um, which really speaks to the popularity and the necessity of a, of a program like this. 
Um, and during that window, 16 million of that 26 million um, were already processed. They were already approved. They were just waiting for the Supreme Court decision to come down to, to give them the green light that they could get their debt canceled. Um, as you know, I'm sure you know, in, in mid-November of 2022, a federal judge in Texas and then a panel of judges in Missouri blocked the debt relief program. The case was heard before the Supreme Court. There was um, the hearing was in February of 2023 of this year. We held a big rally outside of the Supreme Court with a lot of our partners um, to make sure that um, you know they knew that we were heard and seen um, that you know debt relief matters to us and that um, it's a necessary step. Um, and then in late June, the Supreme Court struck down the debt relief plan in a 6-3 decision, um, stating that it was imperm impermissible under the Heroes Act, which is the, the authority that they were using to cancel student debt. Um, so post the, the Supreme Court decision, the president announced that he would be using um, the Higher Education Act to, to go through a different um, process to cancel student debt from here on out. This method will require something called negotiating, negotiated rulemaking, um, which involves, you know, a committee of different constituents um, kind of making the, the plan and, and um, negotiating on what that will look like. It could take several months for this to happen. Um, and so we don't know the parameters of the program or what it will look like yet. But while we await what those guidelines are, um, there are other things that you can do right now to, to get your debt canceled or to manage your student loans. And so we'll go, we're going to walk through some of those um, right now. So first, um, first thing on the agenda is I want to talk about something called the IDR account adjustment. IDR stands for income driven repayment. Um, these, so basically when you graduate your, when you graduate from college or from, you know, your educational program, um, your loans are automatically placed into something called the standard repayment plan. That plan um, has you pay off the entirety of your loan over a period of 10 years. There are these other plans called income driven repayment plans that are pegged to your income. And so they're often more affordable for folks because they're based on your income and not on the total balance of your loans. Um, so they're, you know, really good options for folks. Um, but, you know, what happens is uh, that folks are doing everything right. They're making monthly payments, but perhaps those payments aren't touching the principal of the loan or maybe they're not covering all of the interest. And so you're doing everything right, you're making payments, but you're logging into your account and you're seeing that your balance continues to a balloon um, while you're in repayment, which can be really distressing for so many folks. So to rectify this, the Department of Education made it so that after 20 or 25 years in repayment in these income driven repayment plans, you can get your debt canceled. Um, last year, a government accountability office report um, came out saying that fewer than 200 folks out of a potential universe of like 4 million people um, have ever received cancellation under these plans. So fewer than 200 people, that, you know, that clearly speaks to a program that's not working. And in addition, bar, or, um, servicers were routinely putting people into forbearance or deferment instead of offering them these IDR plans that would have been more affordable and kept them in repayment status. Um, and also servicers had no idea how close people were to this 20 or 25 years, um, that, you know, that threshold that they would need to pass in order to get their debt canceled. Um, so in light of all of this information, the Department of Education announced something called the IDR account adjustment to try to um, fix this, these problems. So what this means is that um, the Department of Education is just basically going to do a one-time audit of all accounts um, to try to figure out how close people are to this 20 or 25 years in repayment so that they can get their debt canceled through IDR plans. They're going to be counting pretty much everything, um, every, you know, every moment in time that you've been in repayment with the exclusion of time that you've spent in default and the exclusion of time that you might have spent in in-school deferment, which is a, a status that your loan goes into when you, you go back to school. They're automatically placed into in-school deferment when you're in school. So they'll count, um, you know, any time that you spent in repayment, some of these forbearances, uh, deferments prior to the year 2013. And one nice thing is that you can keep credit before consolidation. So if you need to consolidate your loans, um, which I'll get to in a moment, you can keep that past credit that you have um, on that loan before you know um, before you consolidate. Um, one note here is that for those with commercial fill and Perkins loans, they must consolidate to to access the IDR account adjustment. For many other folks, you know, for many for most folks, it'll be completely automatic. 
But for these folks in particular, ones with commercial fell or Perkins loans, um, they'll need to consolidate to access this IDR account adjustment. And one other really nice thing about the IDR account adjustment is that any credit that you get towards cancellation under these IDR plans, you know, towards that 20 or 25 year mark, also is credit that you can get towards PSLF. And so if you're seeking public service loan forgiveness, um, which is a 10 year program, um, you know, this is another way to gain credit towards that PSLF um, cancellation. So you might be thinking, how do I figure out if I need to consolidate um, in order to access this program? So um, the best way would be to log into studentaid.gov. This is your clearinghouse for basically any information that you need on your student loans. It's, it's a good idea to, to maybe log in um, and check out what type of loans you have and see what other things um, you're able to find out there, especially before, you know, we know that we're going to get to this later, but we know that, you know, payments are starting again in the fall. And so um, it would be a good idea to just make sure that you understand all the information on your dashboard here. So you'll log into studentaid.gov. If you don't remember your password, you can reset it and gain access. Um, you'll want to go to your dashboard. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. But um, you can also download all of your aid data, which is a more granular report of your entire loan history and repayment history. Um, and so that's also another option in addition to the dashboard. So once you get to your dashboard, it's gonna look something like this. Um, you can see here that this person already consolidated because they have um, you know, direct consolidation, two direct consolidation loans that are um, you know, listed with a balance here and other loans that they also previously had that they consolidated um, are at the bottom. They all have $0 balances. You know, you don't need to worry about the ones with a $0 balance because they're not the ones you're trying to get um, canceled. You know, they're already taken care of. And so you can see that this person already has direct consolidation loans. Um, you might have, you know, some of these Perkins loans or it might say um, something called Federal Family Education Loans or FEL loans, F-F-E-L loans. Um, those are the ones that you'll need to consolidate. So there are two types of federal family education loans or these FELP loans, F-F-E-L-P. Um, some are held by the Department of Education and some are held by commercial lenders. The distinction is important because if you have ones that are held by commercial lenders, those are the ones that you'll need to consolidate in order to access the IDR account adjustment. So you can see here on this person's dashboard, um, in the second block, you know, it says Wells Fargo Black Bank is the uh, servicer. And so that's how you know that it's owned by a private lender. And then on this bottom block here, it says Department of Education or Mohila um, is the servicer. And so that's how you know it would be owned by the Department of Education. Another easy way to tell whether you have Ed, help, Ed held felt loans or commercial help held fell loans um, is if you've been receiving the payment pause during the pandemic. So if you have not been required to make payments during the pandemic, those are owned directly by the Department of Education. If you have been required to make payments, those are commercially held um, FELP loans. And so um, that's another way to tell whether or not you need to consolidate in order to access the IDR account adjustment. Um, so there are some action items here with this IDR account adjustment, particularly around loans that are not currently held by the Department of Education, like I mentioned. So you'll need to consolidate those loans before December 31st of this year in order to, to be part of this IDR account adjustment. Um, the department is already beginning to adjust accounts for those who have been in repayment the longest. And then all other borrowers accounts are going to be adjusted in 2024 after that consolidation deadline to account for folks that are um, trying to consolidate to, to you know, meet the requirements of this. Um, you already heard that you know, a couple of weeks ago that the, the, the president announced that he's going to cancel $39 billion in student debt for 804,000 borrowers. And this is part of that first round of the IDR account adjustment. So it's really exciting that we can see these policy changes happening in real time. Um, and the Department of Education is gonna continue to update these cancellations um, that are happening through the IDR account adjustment every two months until 2024. There might be, I wanna mention here that there might be situations where it makes sense for borrowers to opt out of cancellation during this round. So if you've received an email that said that you were going to be one of these 804,000 borrowers um, who would receive cancellation under income driven repayment plans, um, it might make sense for some people to opt out. Um, for instance, if you have multiple different loans from multiple different timelines, 
those loans are on different timelines for cancellation under IDR plans. So that might mean that some of your loans will get canceled through this round of the IDR account adjustment, but others might be years away from receiving cancellation. Um, one way around this would be to opt out of the cancellation under the IDR account adjustment during this first round, um, consolidate all of your loans to get them on the same timeline, and then wait until the next round of cancellation through the IDR account adjustment um, to get all of your debt canceled at once. So that's one option. Um, just something to consider. Certainly there are, you know, um, things to consider when you're consolidating or whether or not to consolidate, but, um, you know, want to mention that at the top in case anyone did receive that email um, so that you can, you know, make the best choice for you. All right, happy to answer any questions about that at the end as well, because I know it's a lot of information. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program um, and how this interact, interacts with the IDR account adjustment. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program is a program um, that was founded by Congress in 2007 to help borrowers with their student loans, um, you know, pr pr particularly those who are working in public service, and then also so that um, public service workers or, or recent graduates wouldn't be deterred from entering the public service work service um, because of their student loan balances. And to put it simply, PSLF is the promise that if a borrower works um, in public service for 10 years and makes payments on their loans during that time, they can get the remainder of their debt uh, canceled under PSLF. Um, and so how it usually works is there are usually four uh, four requirements of the program. The first is that you have to have a direct loan. That's one of several federal loan types. It's been the main type of federal loan since 2010. So if you took out a loan since 2010, it's likely a direct loan. Um, some of those other loans that I mentioned, like FELP loans, those federal family education loans, um, those can be made eligible by consolidating. Consolidation, um, just to state in case you don't know, is, is a process by which you um, essentially take out a new loan with the federal government. It pays off your old loan and it replaces it with a direct loan. It's like refinancing, um, but it's with the federal government. And so it's not um, like a private lender that you would refinance with. Um, so if you have one of those older loans, like a Felp or Perkins loan, you can consolidate those loans into direct loans to make them eligible for the PSLF program. The second requirement is that you have to be in the right repayment plan, which generally um, for most borrowers will be an income driven repayment plan, which is you know, what I mentioned during the IDR account adjustment section. There are four plans that fall under this um, bucket of plans. Uh, they're income-based repayment or IBR, income contingent repayment or ICR, pay, which is um, like an acronym for pay as you earn, and then uh, repay, which is revised pay as you earn. So those are the four plans that fall under IDR. Um, the third requirement would be to be in the right type of employment, which is a public service employer. That is defined as any level of government. So federal, state, local, or tribal governments all uh, count for PSLF. In addition, um, any 501c3 nonprofit, um, and then certain other nonprofits also fall into this category. Um, something like emergency services, you know, maybe you're working in emergency services, but you're not quite under a government entity and you're not, um, you know, categorized as a 501c3 nonprofit, but you're doing emergency work. And so that sometimes falls under this category most often. Um, and then you have to be working for a public service entity for at least 30 hours a week. Um, so that is the requirement for the public service employer. And then finally, you need to make the right number of payments on your loans, which is 120 payments or 10 years worth of payments. And those payments need to be made on a direct loan um, in while in, in an income driven repayment plan and then while working for the, the public service. So you need to meet all four requirements at once. Now, um, right now in this moment in time, because of the IDR account adjustment, there are some changes. Um, but first, I want to mention that and if you've been receiving the payment pause for the past, you know, three and a half years or so under the, the pandemic, um, all those all those months count towards public service loan forgiveness, even though you haven't been required to make payments. And so um, this is really incredible for folks, you know, that you, you're basically getting three and a half years of, um, of credit without having to make payments. And so um, that's really good news for folks who are seeking PSLF right now. Now, through the IDR account adjustment, there are some things that they've essentially waived during this time period um, so that folks can get closer to that 10-year mark and get extra time to count. 
um, basically they're they're waiving these two requirements. So if you didn't previously have direct loans and you weren't previously on an income driven or payment plan, now is a great time to rectify those things in order to get more credit towards PSLF. Um, and so uh, basically what it means is that if you uh, have one, of, if you don't have a direct loan currently and you have maybe one of those Fell or Perkins loans, um, it's a great time to consolidate to get a direct loan, and then you can keep all that credit that you've had on your previous loan um, towards PSLF, which is not something that usually happens under normal program requirements. Um, and then you should also file a PSLF form if you haven't done this already. Um, and so you can, you know, just certify with your employer that you've worked for, um, you know, such and such organization for X amount of time um, to make sure that you get all of your time to count. Um, okay. Yes. Let's see. Um, and I want to mention here that the same deadline, uh, sorry, I want to mention here that the same deadline applies, um, that there are like serious benefits to consolidating before December 31st of this year for um, those that are seeking PSLF and those that are seeking cancellation under the income driven or payment plans. So um, I have another note here on parent plus borrowers. Um, if you're all familiar with the, the you know, parent plus borrowers are, of course, borrowers who take out loans um, to help with their children's education. You know, they take them out in their name, but it's for their child to go to attend college or school. Um, and they've been traditionally excluded from some things. Um, for instance, there was a public service loan forgiveness waiver that was in effect from 2021 to 2022, um, and they were excluded from that. Um, but so uh, after a lot of hardworking advocates, you know, really tried to to get them, um, you know, more credit towards cancellation, um, the Department of Education announced at the end of last year that parent plus borrowers can now get uh, credit towards PSLF through the IDR account adjustment, which is huge. Um, it's going to put people in a much better, better position to, to be on track for PSLF. Um, and so if you are a, a Parent PLUS borrower, one thing that you should do is you should um, uh, submit your PSLF forms um, for any employment that you've had since October 1st, 2007. And that's true for anyone seeking PSLF. You know, the, the clock kind of started on October 1st, 2007, um, because that's when the program was created. So you can um, submit paperwork for any time that you've had in public service since October 1st, 2007. And then also you could consider consolidating to get on an income driven or payment plan if you haven't reached 10 years in public service. Um, I say consider consolidating here because it might make more sense for some folks who have Parent PLUS loans to stay on the standard plan, especially since um, you know you may have you, you've gotten you know three and a half years of extra credit towards PSLF without having to make payments. It might be more affordable to stay on the standard plan. So for Parent PLUS borrowers in particular, um, it might be a good idea to go to studentaid.gov. There's a repayment calculator tool that'll tell you um, you know you'll plug in your numbers and you'll, you'll be able to see which plan might be most affordable for you moving forward. Um, and so it might make more sense for some folks to consolidate and it might make sense for some folks to stay on the standard plan and not consolidate. Um, so I just wanna mention that here, but the good news is that, you know, parent plus borrowers can get retroactive credit towards PSLF through this IDR account adjustment now. Okay, and just to remind you that the deadline to consolidate is December 31st of, at the end of this year. Um, the PSLF forms can be submitted at any time. That isn't part of um, this deadline. The deadline is really for consolidation. And so, um, you know, if you're seeking PSLF or you're seeking uh, cancellation through IDR plans, uh, you know, consider consolidating before this deadline. All right, just to recap this um, public service loan forgiveness section, so again, check what type of loans you have at studentaid.gov. If you don't have direct loans, consolidate before December 31st of this year. If you have Parent PLUS loans, um, weigh your options between consolidating or not consolidating to get on an income driven or payment plan. And then um, submit all of your PSLF forms for eligible public service work that you've had since October 1st of 2007. Okay, now we're gonna switch gears a little bit to talk about something called Fresh Start. 
Fresh Start is an initiative for borrowers who are in default. There are about 7 million people in default right now. Um, default, you know, really affects your credit negatively. Um, you know, it can be really damaging for a lot of folks. And so this is meant to be a way for folks to get out of default more easily. Um, typically, if you're in default, there are two ways out of default. One is through consolidation that I mentioned, or um, something called rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is a pretty onerous process. It takes about 10 months. Um, there is like a monitoring period so that uh, the Department of Education can ensure that you're able to make payments. Um, so it, it takes a long time. And so Fresh Start is meant to be a much quicker and easier way for folks to get out of default. Um, it immediately restores repayment options for folks, including those income-driven repayment plans that I mentioned during this uh, presentation, um, which might be really affordable for, for some folks. It also immediately restores your ability to go back to school. So if you've been um, out of school, but you've been wanting to go back, but have been precluded from getting more um, aid because of your default status, um, you know now is a chance that you would be able to go back to school and get aid from an eligible school. It also restores your rehabilitation option if you did that during the pandemic um, or during the payment pause. Um, so it'll automatically restore that rehabilitation um, feature. Uh, it, you know, restores your credit, and then it protects people from involuntary collections as well. So um, these are the list of eligible defaulted loans um, that are eligible for Fresh Start. One note that I want to make is that your loans had to have defaulted prior to March 13th of 2020 when the payment pause began. Um, no borrowers should have been in default after that date because of, um, like, different ed guidance. So no one should have been in defaulting after that date. Um, but the loan had to have defaulted before this date. So, you know, for instance, if repayment begins um, and at some point in the future you were put into default, um, you know, th that those loans wouldn't be eligible for the Fresh Start uh, program. And this is a smaller slice of the pie, but I just want to mention the ineligible defaulted loans um, in case this is this applies to anyone on the call. Now, like many of these other things, there it, this isn't exactly automatic, and so um, borrowers basically have one year after the payment pause ends. So that you know that means we're looking at basically September of 2024 to do one of two things in order to get out of default through Fresh Start. The first is that you could communicate with your guarantee agency or with the default resolution group, that's what DRG stands for, um, to request to re re enter a repayment plan. Um, so you could either request to be put on a repayment plan or you could request um, aid at an eligible school if you're looking to go back to school. If you choose the latter option, the school will just need to get a signed statement from you saying that you agree to be put um, back in repayment to a non-default uh, servicer. Um, but those are your two options and you basically have a year to do those in order to get out of default more easily. If you don't do one of these things within the year, um, your loans will automatically be pay placed back into default using the original date of delinquency. So there are a lot of incentives to, to taking part in this program if you're currently in default. Okay. So next, uh, we'll just review a little bit about how to prepare for a return to repayment, since it's probably on top of folks' minds, um, given that it's only, you know, a month or two away. So, um, as you may know, the, the, the payment pause is scheduled to end after August 30th of 2023. Um, there's no option for it to be extended at the moment. You know, um, this was part of the debt ceiling negotiations, and so this is really cemented in the state. Um, Interest will start accruing in September and payments will be due in October. And to prepare for that, you could update your contact information at studentaid.gov and you could also update it with your servicer. Um, also, if you don't know who your servicer currently is, you could log into studentaid.gov to figure out who your servicer is so that you can contact them and update your, your contact information. Just given that so many people have moved during the pandemic, it's, it's a good practice. You can also um, still request a refund for any payments that you've made since March 13th of 2020 when the payment pause began. Um, this is, you know, particularly useful for folks who are maybe seeking cancellation through PSLF. Um, you know, if you were already kind of hoping that your loans will get canceled through PSLF, um, you could request a, a refund given that, you know, that, that three and a half years of time already counts for PSLF. So it's a little bit of money, extra money in your pocket. Um, in addition, if you've been on income driven repayment plans, you know, every year you need to recertify to, to make sure that they know your income so that they can calculate your monthly payment. And so um, 
you know, it's a good idea to remember to do that. And they're still accepting uh, verbal income driven repayment um, recertifications like over the phone. Um, so that's still an option for folks. And then just remember to continue to enroll and recertify your income driven repayment plans each year. Um, because otherwise you'll be you know, placed automatically back into the standard plan, which will be a higher monthly payment for you. Um, if you had automatic payments before set up before the, the pandemic began, um, you know, the Department of Education has said that they're not automatically restarting those. And so um, you need to, you know, opt in and call your servicer to, to get back on an auto debited payment uh, schedule. Um, so, so if that's something that you're interested in, those would be the steps that you would need to take. You'd need to contact your servicer to get put on, um, you know, the automatic payment plan again. Um, but I also mentioned this because they shouldn't be happening. So if you log into your, you know, your bank account and you see that they were, auto, you know, auto debiting your, your payment, um, that shouldn't be happening. So just stating that uh, so that folks know. Some other things to consider about payments restarting um, is that there's an on-ramp an on-ramp to repayment, um, which will basically last until September 30th of next year. So this means that if you miss a payment at any point during this year from September um, of 2023 to September of 2024, um, those payments will not be considered delinquent. They, um, you know, there will be no negative credit reporting on those payments. You won't be placed into a default um, and you won't be, you know, referred to debt collection agencies. So, you know, this is meant to really give people a long runway uh, getting back into repayment. Um, but the, the downside of that is that in, interest will continue to accrue during that time. Um, and so, you know, uh, just keeping that in mind uh, if, if this applies to you. And then um, I also wanted to mention here that President Biden announced um, a new repayment plan called SAVE or Saving on a Valuable Education. This uh, will be much more affordable for folks, particularly if you only have undergraduate loans. Um, there's going to be no unpaid interest capitalization, so there's essentially going to, to pay off the interest each month so that you don't, you know, have the same problem of logging into your account, even though you made payments and seeing that your, you know, balance continues to balloon. Um, there's also going to be 10 years, I'm sorry, after 10 years of repayment, um, there will be cancellation for folks who borrowed less than $12,000 initially. And then there's a sliding scale for that too. So, um, you know, it'll be like 11 years for those who borrowed up to $13,000 or 12 years for those who borrowed up to $14,000 and so on. Um, and so this is meant to be much more affordable for folks. Um, if you've already been in IDR plans, particularly if you've already been enrolled in the repay plan, that, that fourth one I mentioned, um, revised pay as you earn, you'll be automatically put into the save plan. Um, but if this is something of interest to you, then, you know, um, you could call your servicer to, to get put into this repayment plan. Um, okay, so... I know that was a ton of information. We'll just get to through. We'll just get through some important takeaways, and then we'll get to your questions. Okay. So first, um, check what type of loans you have by logging into Student Aid Deck Up. This is going to affect what you're eligible for in terms of cancellation programs, and so um, that is the best way to figure that out. Remember that if you um, have those commercial held FELP loans or um, if you don't have direct loans, but you're seeking PSLF, um, there are a lot of benefits to consolidating before December 31st of this year. If you're seeking PSLF, um, remember to complete your PSLF forms. Um, you can do that at studentaid.gov using the PSLF help tool. It's a pretty easy process. Um, and so uh, remember to do that if you're seeking PSLF. If you are in default and you wanna take part in Fresh Start, remember that you have one year after the payment pause ends to either um, request to be put on a repayment plan or to be, you know, to ask for aid at an eligible school um, so that you can get out of default. A um, couple other items. So there is a lot moving in the student loan system right now. A lot of things are uh, changing. You know, people are going to be entering repayment for the first time in three years. Um, a lot of servicers have changed, you know, some have exited the student loan servicing market. So new servicers are, um, you know, taking over and this might be the first interaction that you've had with your servicer in three years. And so there's just a lot moving. And, and I mentioned that because, um, you know, just be aware of scams, you know, because so much is moving, there's going to be people
people looking to take advantage of that. You'll never um, receive, you know, a phone call that is from a legit legitimate source, you know, asking you to pay money in order to receive debt cancellation. The Department of Education will always email you with information. Um, and so just make sure that you're getting things from a reliable source like studentaid.gov, um, you know, to make sure that you're, you're on track for certain things. Now, finally, um, if you experience any issues, please file complaints. Um, the more complaints that an agency receives about a certain issue, the more likely they are to respond to that issue. In addition, complaints are used um, for shaping the, the policy of the future. And so if there are a lot of ongoing problems, um, it's really helpful in, sh in shaping future policy. Um, you can file a complaint with the Federal Student Aid Ombudsperson within the Department of Education. Um, also, some states have ombudspersons at the state level, um, so you could check to see. We keep a list of them on our website, and I'll share that out with the recording tomorrow. Um, and then finally, uh, you could also complain to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as well. Um, so those are you know, kind of three options for complaining, um, but highly recommend that you complain if you're experiencing issues with any of the things that I mentioned today. All right, so I think um, now we have time for some Q&A and I'll pass it over to Kat uh, who will share some of your questions. Um, thanks so much, Amy, that was great. And I know that was a lot of information. And so just before we jump into questions, um, one of the first ones they got was just asking about, will this be recorded? So yes, this webinar is being recorded. And after today's webinar, um, later this week, you'll get an email with the recording of this webinar um, as well as some of the resources that we might mention during the Q&A. And so if you know others who weren't able to join, um, you can feel free to share that link. It will also be available on the Student Bar Protection Center's YouTube page. Um, so yes, there will be a recording. Um, and then with that, Amy, we can, um, we can jump in. One of our first questions is about consolidation. So someone says they have, you know, sev several loans that are, they know their Department of Education held. Um, the first part this is a two part question. One, can they consolidate all of those loans into one? And then two, what might be some of the pros and cons of consolidating? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so the answer is yes, you can consolidate all those four loans into one. Um, so one of the benefits of that, so say you have loans from different time periods, um, you know, maybe you took out loans for your undergraduate degree and then you took out more loans at a later date for your graduate degree. Um, one of the benefits to consolidating all of them together would be that they'll be placed on the same timeline. And so they'll, and they'll be placed on the timeline of the oldest loan in particular. So if you're seeking PSLF or you want more credit towards this IDR account adjustment, um, this is one way to gain a little bit of extra credit. Um, but the nice thing is that they'd be on the same timeline. So, you know, for instance, I mentioned those folks that are, um, you know, maybe have multiple different types of loans for different time periods. Um, and so some of them will be canceled under the IDR account adjustment, but some of them will be hanging, um, you know, and, and still in repayment for a couple more years. So one of the benefits would be to, to get um, on the same timeline so that they're all canceled at once when you're doing something like PSLF. Um, uh, you know, another, uh, you know, perhaps a con or something to consider is that your interest rate could change um, when you consolidate. It's usually like a weighted average of all of your different interest um, rates at the moment. Um, and so that's something to consider, but, you know, that's um, like most people aren't super concerned about that, especially if they're seeking PSLF or looking to get their debt canceled um, through a program like that. Um, and so I think those are the main pros and cons to consider. Kat, I'm not sure if I missed any or if you have anything to add on that front. That's great. Um, thanks so much, Amy. And it, it was really helpful you brought up a, a point about you know people consolidating for purposes of PSLF. Um, that was one of the questions we actually just got. Um, someone was wondering, um, if they could still be eligible for PSLF if they've already stopped working. So they've already consolidated and, you know, into a direct loan, but are they PSLF eligible if they're no longer working? This is a great question. Um, so this is something that actually changed on July 1st. So previously, um, in order to get PSLF, you had to still be working at the time that you received PSLF. This changed in July that you have to be working at the time that you submit your paperwork for PSLF, but not at the time that you receive it. So, um, you know, this is really life changing for folks who have been delaying retirement um, in order to get PSLF. Um, so the answer is like, yes, you still need to be working at the time that you submit your paperwork. Um, but one other thing that I want to mention about PSLF is that 
you know, it doesn't have to be consecutive. So, so I, I mentioned that, you know, you need to have 120 payments or 10 years worth of payments on your loans while working in public service, you know, on an IDR plan while, you know, you have a direct loan. Um, this time doesn't need to be consecutive though. So say you were working in the public service for five years um, and then you decided to move to the private sector for a couple of years and then you came back um, and worked in the, the public sector again. Um, you know, that time, it doesn't have to be consecutive. It's just cumulative. So if you, you know, you had that five years from before and then, um, you know, you would kind of pick up where you left off after your private sector time. So the private sector time wouldn't count, um, but, you know, you don't have to have it all at once happen. Um, and so like the short answer is yes, you still need to be working at the time that you submit your paperwork. Thanks, Amy. Super helpful. Um, we also have a couple questions about, about IDR. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of go through the one through one, but the first one is you mentioned something about, um, IDR recertifications being extended. Do you mind explaining what that means? Yeah, so this was particular to the pandemic, really, direct to the payment pause. Um, so instead of folks having to, to recertify their income-driven or payment plans for the past, you know, three and a half years, um, they were automatically, re you know, recertified. Um, you know, this is going to change, uh, but but your payments will begin um, in you know, in October when they're due, they'll be the same amount that they were. If you were on an income driven or payment plan, for instance, you know, they'll be on the same amount that you were paying um, in March of 2020, which is huge for folks because some people's salaries went up, right? And their their payment, their monthly payment will change based on that salary. Um, but, you know, one of the nice things is that it's, it's starting back where you left off. Um, and I think, you know, you'll have uh, a little bit of time before you have to recertify to get on a, you know, to get that higher monthly payment. Um, and so that that recertification piece was particular to the pandemic. Um, you know, that won't be true, you know, in a few months. Um, but so that was what that meant in particular. Amy, um, we also have a question about the save plan. Someone was wondering, um, how do they get um, access to that, um, to that plan? So um, should they apply, um, or do they, or, or until it's available, what, do you know what the options they should take? Yeah, sure. Um, so the safe plan will be rolled out, uh, gradually. So essentially some parts of it are, are kind of being rolled out this year and some parts will be rolled out next July. Um, and so, um, you could, contact your servicer to get placed on an income driven or payment plan. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the guidance is for those servicers at the moment, or if, you, if you'd be act, asking to, to apply for save or asking to be put on the repay plan, which will become the save plan. Um, but the, the plan right now is called repay. Um, and uh, those that are already enrolled in repay will be automatically moved to the save plan. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Kat. If you have any other information that you'd like to fill in, please feel free. Yeah, that'll be, that, that was great. And I, one, like Amy said, anyone who's enrolled in repay will automatically be put into the save plan. And so Amy's advice, um, one really important thing, um, one, go to federalstudentaid.gov. Um, they have information specifically on the save plan, just so you can learn more about the plan. Two, if you're already enrolled in a repay plan, you'll be automatically placed into the save plan once it's it's rolled out. And then two, you can also speak to your servicer um, to, to get enrolled in those plans and just flagging to make sure also if you're eligible for repay, which will automatically enroll you in save or once save is fully rolled out, you can also ask if you're eligible for that plan. But just repeating what Amy already said. <laughs> so thanks, Amy. Um, and then another question um, about IDR, and before we get into this question, I will note, because we have a couple of questions that are a little bit more specific about people's um, individual situations. One, we're not allowed to give you specific guidance on your individual situation, and so we always encourage people to check out resources at federalstudentaid.gov. We will share resources on our cancelmystudentdebt.org website, which I'll share as soon as I ask this question in the chat. But um, we can talk to you generally about um, some guiding principles, but really encourage you to look at these resources to figure out what would work best for your financial situation. Or if you know a financial coach or counselor working in these areas to ask more specific questions. 
But someone mentioned they were told um, they're given advice that they actually should try to pay as little as possible. Um, is that a goal? And can you talk a little bit about why someone might say that in terms of picking um, an income driven repayment plan possibly versus enrolling maybe in a standard plan? Can you talk about why someone might suggest that? Yeah, sure. Um, so just to, to reiterate again, the standard plan is the one that you're automatically placed into once you go back into repayment or once you go into repayment. Um, it has you paying off the entire balance of your loan in 10 years. And so um, for some folks, that might be like an astronomical expense, especially if you have like, say you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans, you know, that just becomes completely unmanageable. So there are these other things called income driven repayment plans um, that are based on your income um, and are often more affordable for folks. You know, they're certainly not perfect, but they're they're often more affordable for folks. Um, and, you know, if you're, you know, if you're very low income, you could even qualify for a zero dollar month of zero dollar payment per month, um, you know, because it's based on your income. So, um, you know, you might want to make, you know, payments that are as little as possible, especially if you're, you know, seeking something like PSLF, where the, the remainder of your debt is going to be canceled after 10 years, um, because, you know, you'd essentially be, uh, you know, saving a bunch of money. So like if the standard plan has you paying off that debt in 10 years anyway, um, being on an income driven repayment plan may have you making like a lower monthly payment while also, you know, achieving debt cancellation after 10 years. Um, and so those might be like some of the, that might be like some, you know, a reason why people have said like pay as little as possible on your student loans. Um, so that, yeah, that, that would be something that I would keep in mind. Thanks, Amy. That was great. And this next question, I'm just going to answer it because it might be easier to answer than to explain it and then ask. Someone has a question about someone who borrowed prior to 2007 but worked in public service was wondering if they're still eligible for PSLF. Just clarifying something that Amy said earlier at the beginning of the program, the PSLF program began in 2007. So if you have public qualifying public service employment after 2007, you could still get credit for those months, even if your loans are older than that 2007 date. It's about when did you do your public service and then applying for the program after the date of 2007, not necessarily if your loans are older than that date. And then someone asks about questions, are there discharges for people who, um, who have, um, who have, who have disabilities that keep them from being able to work? Once I drop our link to cancel my student debt, there is a um, there is a link on our page to a program that the Department of Education has called Total and Permanent Disability Discharge. If you go to that page, you can learn a little bit more about that program um, and see if it's something that you you would be eligible for. So I'll drop that link and you can visit that there. Um, question, Amy, I know we get this question a lot and I'm sure other people have this on their minds. If people want to know where they can get help about this, because you understand these are really complicated issues, a lot of times they're deeply individual to your own personal situation, but can you talk a little bit about where people can get um, guidance or help? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first I would check out cancelmystudentdebt.org. That's our resource. It has a step-by-step -step guide on how to apply for PSLF. It has information about the IDR account adjustment, fresh start, uh, TPD, as Kat mentioned. It has a lot of FAQs on it. So we find that a lot of questions can be answered that way. Um, next, you know, if you're having an issue, I would recommend reaching out to the federal student aid ombudsperson. You know, you could file a complaint, um, you know, there. And then also check out that state resources list on our cancel student debt, cancel my student debt website, um, because there are ombudspersons at the state level that often, um, you know, might have more time to do kind of like individual counseling or, you know, just kind of clarify some of your questions that you might have. Um, we don't have any organizations, you know, that we like recommend doing this work. Um, another option, I guess I should mention is that like you might um, be eligible for help from like a legal aid office in your city um, or, you know, your city might offer you free financial counseling um, through like a financial empowerment center. Um, so those I think would be good options for seeking help help if you need more help on an individual basis. We also, oh, sorry, one more thing. We also have a resources page on our cancelmystudentdebt.org page um, that has a link to the National Consumer Law Center's page um, for resources, um, which, you know, have like different resources in each city listed out. Um, and so that might be a good place to start if you really find that you need more individual counseling or, or need, you know, legal help with some of these issues. 
Thanks, Amy. And another really quick question someone was asking about IDR. And also just a quick note to anyone who's put um, questions in the chat box, if you could please drop them in the Q&A so we could, we could see them and drop them as they come in. But we had a question about um, IDR payments and how they're calculated um, and how to get access to an income driven repayment plan. So IDR plans are just are calculated by a, um, a calculation with the Department of Education based on your family size as determined by your your um, by your tax filing and your income. And so those are those are the determining factors that go into those calculations. Um, in order to access those, you can reach out um, either directly to your servicer or you can sign up on um, studentaid.gov. And I want to add to that, Kat, too, that like those four plans that I mentioned that fall under income driven or payment plans are all different. And so that's why it's a great um, idea to use the, the um, repayment calculator tool at studentaid.gov to figure out which one's best for you, because some of them, you know, include um, your spouse's income if you file jointly, some of them don't. And so it's, it's really, you know, it would be good to use that tool to figure out which will be um, best for you. And the same is true, like if you are consolidating um, at the end of your consolidation, you know, you'll, you'll be able to see see um, the different repayment plans and like the interest rates and, and you'll be able to like have a clear picture of like what you can expect from your monthly payments moving forward. Thanks, Amy. That was really helpful. Um, another really quick question I'll answer before asking the next one. We got a question about someone asking about tax consequences with the IDR account adjustment and, and, and IDR um, cancellation. Just a really quick note. This is also where we would advise you to, um, to talk specifically to to um to a tax professional depending on how it works by your state um so we'll not answer that one directly but we'll just ask you to um to to consult because we cannot give advice on taxes other than the, um but amy i don't know if you have anything else to add but just want to drop that note in there um no that was great i think like the only thing to add is that um because of like federal legislation, no student loan cancellation will be tax included as tax or sorry included as income uh, for tax purposes until the year 2025. That's at the federal level, but that's not true of certain states, and so it depends where you live. Um, so as Kat mentioned, you know, it would be a good idea to look up the rules of your own state. Thanks, Amy. Super helpful. Um, and then question about of forbearance with the IDR account adjustment. So if someone has more than that 36, cum 36 cumulative forbearances, do they get credit for every other forbearance over that? So say someone has four years of forbearance or five years of forbearance, would they get credit for every single month as soon as they reach that threshold of 36 cumulative forbearances? Um, so I think the answer um, is that you can have an audit uh, done like so if you think that there are other forbearances you have that aren't being counted in the IDR account adjustment once they once they do it in 2024 um, you can request that the Department of Education reviews your account um, to make sure that you're getting as many forbearances as possible um, but Kat please correct me if I'm wrong yeah and yeah I'm sorry I probably didn't read this question right so the Department of Education will count your forbearances over 36. So for example, if you have 37 months of total forbearance, you will get credit for all 37 of those months. If you have 60 months of total forbearance, you'll get credit for all those 60 months because it passes that 36 month threshold. Um, yes, thank you, this slide. Yeah, no problem, I read yeah, yeah. the way I read it. Um, and then another question about someone um, who, who um, this might be a two part question, so I'm gonna read this and I might, follow up as someone who's trying to qualify for PSLF. If um, they previously worked in public service, but no longer, they're now working in the private sector, no longer working in public service, can they still get PSLF credit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so something I forgot to mention is that, you know, if you're seeking PSLF, um, you can, you know, really submit paperwork at any time. We recommend that you submit it actually each year that you're in the public service to make sure that you're on track because there have been so many historical issues with the program. So you could submit your PSLF forms every year to make sure that the Department of Education knows that you're interested. Um, and then every time you change public service jobs, um, you know, uh, you don't have to do this. You could apply after 10 years, but this is a great way of catching any mistakes that are made in real time and dealing with them as they come up. And there have been so many mistakes made with this program that um, that's why we recommend that. If you have left the public service, you're working in the private sector right now, but say you have like five, seven years, however many, however much time, 
um, you know, it's a good idea to submit paperwork for that past time to get that past credit because you don't know which direction your career might take in the future. Um, so this is just kind of like raising your hand with the, the Department of Education and saying, I'm interested in PSLF um, and I'm, you know, perhaps going to accrue credit some other time, but um, you might as well get that on the books to, to let them know that you want that time counted for PSLF. Thanks so much, Amy. And just a note to add that you could check with your servicer um, on the servicing website to see how many qualifying payments you have if you have a question about where you are in terms of your payment count. Um, thanks so much, Amy. Yeah, um, can I add a clarification oh, to for the sure. forbearance note? Okay, so I, I noticed that someone's confused still, um, which is fair. So the on the, the piece about forbearances under the IDR account adjustment, so basically they'll count, um, hold on, let me make sure I say this right, so up to 12 consecutive months or over 36 cumulative months, so, um, or this other category, so if you have other forbearances that don't quite meet, you know, fall into those two buckets of up to 12 consecutive months or over 36 cumulative months of forbearance, um, you know, that's when you can get, like, a review done to find out if you get those other forbearances to count, but um, those are the options, so if you have, you know, um, 50 months of forbearance, you know, that's over 36 cumulative months, so those will automatically be count, counted in the IDR account adjustment. So I understand that that language on the slide was a bit confusing. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for that clarification. Um, I have a, let's see if there are any more. Um, um, so I, I think maybe I'll, there's a, a question here that I see that maybe we could tackle um, related to, IDR plans and the PSLF program. Um, so someone's basically asking like they were on an IDR plan, uh, but now they work for a public service entity. And so they want to figure out how these two things like interact. Um, this, this information is like really confusing. I, I like, you know, we totally understand. We talk to borrowers all the time and, um, you know, we try to present it in the, the most uh, succinct and understandable way possible, but it's just, it's confusing information and it's a lot of information and everything is continuing to change. And so, um, just want to make sure that like, you know, income driven or payment plans are the payment plans that you have, um, that are often more affordable for folks, right? The PSLF program is a separate program, um, but they are related because ha being on an income driven or payment plan is um, for most folks, you know, the, the plan that will be more affordable and that will get you closer to PSLF um, in the future. And so, um, you know, just kind of want to like mention that distinction there that they are, you know, a bit related, but, um, you know, you can be on an IDR plan seeking PSLF, but maybe you move to the private sector and then your best option for cancellation would be to, um, you know, get cancellation after 20 or 25 years in repayment through the IDR plans. So um, I, I just want to like state that like they are separate, but they also are related. Um, so I hope I didn't further confuse anyone, but um, I know we've been getting a couple of questions about that in the Q&A. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any more that we haven't answered. Oh, do you mind talking about the 20 or 25 year timeline for IDR? Yeah, sure. That's good. Um, so the 20 or 25 year timeline is basically um, you can get cancellation after 20 years if you, you only have undergraduate loans. If you have a combination of undergraduate and graduate loans, that's when the 25 year mark, um, you know, becomes uh, your reality, I guess. So it depends on whether you just have undergraduate loans or if you have a combination of undergraduate and graduate loans. Short on time, so two really quick questions. One, someone had a clarifying question on being needing to be employed in order to get PSLF um, cancellation. Do you mind one more time going through that? Yeah, sure. So, so you need to be employed still at the time that you apply. For At the time you submit your paperwork, you need to still be employed. Um, but you can submit your paperwork and then, uh, you know, like not be employed the next day. You don't have to be employed at the time that they'd make a determination, just the time that you will apply. Um, difference. Awesome. And then um, two really quick questions before we end out on um, IDR. One, what's the timeline for um, the IDR account adjustment? And then two, um, how do people actually find out how close they are to the cancellation mark for IDR? Yeah, this is great. These are great questions. You're asking so many good questions today. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for all of your attention. Um, so 
the timeline for the IDR account adjustment is that they will begin and they already have begun, um, you know, uh, doing the audit for accounts that are over the threshold of 20 or 25 years. Um, and then some folks that have already achieved, um, you know, the PSLF after 10 years um, as well. So they're doing the accounts that have been in repayment longest first. And then all other, and they're, sorry, they're going to keep doing that on a two month kind of cycle. So like, you know, they just announced this in July. So I guess we could probably expect, um, you know, another announcement in like September or so. Um, so they're going to do that every two months until 2024. And then in 2024, they're going to do the big audit for all those that are that are really not um, maybe as close to, to cancellation after 20 or 25 years. And then how you can find out um, how close you are to the 20 or 25 year mark. Um, you know, once the IDR account adjustment happens for everyone in 2024, there will be a way to tell this doesn't exist yet. Um, this uh, this should live on studentaid.gov. And so um, that is where you will be able to find that information, but it, it does not exist yet. Okay, I think that those are all the questions we have time for today. Um, Kat, thank you so much for your help with the questions. Do you have anything to add, Kat, before we... Please. No, just thank you for answering all the questions. Yeah, thank you so much for joining today. I hope this was helpful. I'll be sharing a recording and some resources out um, tomorrow. So look forward to that. Um, and I hope you all have a great weekend. And um, thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye.